Man, it is good to be here with you guys today. If you got your Bibles, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 21. It's going to be the text that we look at today. Um, we've been going um, through, uh, for the last couple of months here at Brown Prairie, a series called Bible 101. And if you've been here, especially the last two weeks, we've really talked a lot about Passover, okay? And if you do not know that and you've been here the last two weeks, you might want to wake up, okay? We've been talking about that for the past two weeks, a lot about what the Passover was in the Old Testament. And to kind of catch you up, if you haven't been here, uh, I'm going to try to succinctly summarize everything that we've talked about in two months. The Bible is a story with a central character, Jesus Christ. The main character of Scripture is Jesus Christ that we see coming on the scene in the New Testament. The Old Testament points to him, towards him. The Gospels record him, and the rest of the New Testament pretty much are looking back at him and working out his teachings, okay? That's kind of a basic synopsis, if you will, of the Bible. In the last two weeks specifically, we've talked about how the Old Testament custom of Passover, uh, there when the Jewish people were in the nation of Egypt under captivity, that for God to deliver them, he was going to do this uh, great plague and bring it up on the Egyptian people, that they would, the, the Israelites would slaughter a lamb, uh, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their houses, and the angel would pass over those houses and deliver the people from the judgment of God. That's what Passover basically is saying. And we know, because we have thousands of years of history and the rest of the story, that the Passover was actually pointing to the deliverance that Jesus Christ would ultimately bring for people who chose to follow him in obedience and faith in the grace and mercy of God through the cross of Calvary, that we would all be passed over for judgment again. But it would be judgment for eternity, that the Passover was pointing towards the cross, okay? That's what we're talking about today. Well, today, even though it's, we're fast-forwarding you know, hundreds and hundreds of, well, thousands of years into the future here, uh, from, from where we were in Exodus, we are really at a point in the story that I want us to pull away and talk about something that's pertinent to today, Palm Sunday. Uh, if you know the, the calendar, we talked about that in the last couple of weeks, that uh, the Passover was the start of a new month. And on the 10th day, the Israelites were to select the lamb, and on the 14th day, they were to slaughter the lamb, and, and then that was going to be when they ate the Passover, right? Y'all remember that? Some of y'all are like, what's he talking about? If you've not been here, that's fine. If you've been here, please go back and listen. But anyway, when we talk about Palm Sunday and we talk about Jesus entering into Jerusalem to spend the last week of his earthly life to go to the cross, right? What you may not know is that this is all happening right around Passover week. Okay, some scholars even believe that the day that Jesus, who is the who, the Lamb of God, comes into Jerusalem is the actual day that the people were selecting their lambs for the slaughter. I mean, it's the same window of time. Do not miss the imagery there. It's, it's important here, okay? So when we talk about Passover and we point toward Jesus, today we're going to talk about the one who is going to fulfill the Passover requirement as Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but well into the future from what they were looking forward to back in Exodus. And then we'll go back after Easter and pick up some more Old Testament, okay? But right now we're going to talk about how Jesus accomplishes Passover. We're going to talk about his resurrection next week. And then after that, we'll go back into the Old Testament and make sure that we cover that in order to give a good survey of the Bible. But, but before we do, I want to kind of ask you a question. Can, what would it take? Can you imagine how much people must have been anticipating Jesus? I mean, the whole Old Testament is pointing toward a Messiah, pointing toward this deliverer that's going to come into the world and make things right. I mean, not just hundreds, but thousands of years, really. Ever, really, ever since the Garden of Eden, people have been looking forward to God making mankind right with himself, okay? This is not something that's just Jesus showed up on the scene and, and started a new teaching. This is something that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jewish nation was looking forward to. They called him Messiah, the coming king, right? The idea was they believed 
falsely that this king was going to come and make everything right physically in the world. He was going to conquer the nation of Rome, who was oppressing the Jewish people at the time, just like the Egyptians were back at the original Passover, that this king was going to come in, set up an earthly kingdom, make everything right. Israel would be ruling. Everybody else would be submitting, and he would set things in order. That's what the people believed was going to happen. And so they were looking forward to it. The question is, is can't you imagine, I mean, don't you imagine if you were looking not forward to something that when he came on the scene, you would recognize it, right? It just seems like you would. It would, you would if you were looking for the right things. Okay, so, so they're looking for the wrong things, and we're going to see that in a second. But, but what we're going to do today, I want to talk to you today about this idea of missing the king when he comes into your life. You know, the people there, they rejected Jesus for all sorts of reasons. The religious leaders rejected him because he didn't meet the religious qualifications they wanted him to meet. The people probably rejected him for any number of reasons. You know, and he was performing miracles. Maybe if you didn't get the miracle you wanted, you turned your back on him. But something happened with the crowd between Palm Sunday when he comes in and the crucifixion on Friday. Something happened, right? The masses turned. Well, what I want to do is make sure that we don't miss Jesus in our world. I want to make sure that we understand who Jesus is so that when he comes around, we actually can recognize him for who he is. Because I think there's three options when you're encountered with the real Jesus. Number one, you can take him as he is, the pleasant and the unpleasant, right? You're saying there's things about Jesus that's unpleasant? Amen. There are things about being a believer that are unpleasant to my flesh. Naturally, I want to get all the money I can in my life. I want to have as much pleasure and comfort and ease as I possibly can. That is in my flesh. When Jesus comes into my life, I now have a conflict, amen? And I have to decide, am I going to let my flesh be Lord of me, or am I going to let Christ be Lord of me? You see, there's some unpleasant things, some uncomfortable things about following Jesus. It means you're going to have to say no to some things you want to say yes to. And it means you're going to have to say yes to some things you might want to say no to. But, but it, so one group of people will just embrace him as he is, the pleasant and the unpleasant. A second option would be to reject him completely. I just, I hear what you're saying, Jesus. I hear the message of the cross, but I reject it on its own merit. That, that's an option. But I think a more popular option that many people in churches today take, and it's still a rejection, is to change him to be more to my liking. And so I don't really reject him outright, but I kind of build my own version of Jesus that I want to exist, and then I follow that version with my life. I think that's probably the most dangerous of all the three. At least with the rejection, you know you've outright rejected him, and you can admit that later on if you decide to follow him. But I think there's a lot of people in this world, and I think there's a lot of people in churches that have created a false version of Jesus that doesn't really exist, and they're chasing that Jesus with all that they have, and they're going to miss the real Jesus altogether. So the question is, is who is Jesus, and I'm willing to ta- am I willing to take him as he is? Well, in the, in the story of Palm Sunday, in the account in Matthew 21, the first 11 verses, we see that Jesus is very popular here. And we're going to talk about that popularity in a minute. But there's five, I guess, parts of Jesus here that we see that I want to flesh out a little bit this morning so that we can either accept him or reject him. What I don't want to do is give you a false impression of who Jesus is, and you make a decision based off a false impression rather than the true word of God. And so if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, read with me. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was sp- spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, or prophet saying, sorry, Zechariah actually, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them uh, their cloaks 
And he sat on them, and most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Five parts of Jesus that I want us to kind of talk about today to either decide if we're going to accept him or if we're going to reject him. Now, the crowds are accepting of him, but they don't fully understand what they're accepting at this point. But we have, like I said, a couple of thousand years of history since then that we kind of understand what these pictures and these words mean a little better than a first century Jewish person. I think we fault them a lot. That's a little little side note, right? I think a lot of times we overestimate how good we are. Amen? Like if I'd have been there, I would have never gone along with the crowd. I dare to say that most of us go along with the crowd every single day. Amen? And I'm not sure it'd be that much different if we were in the crowd in Jerusalem that week. I would like to think it would be, but it probably wouldn't be because I know me better than you know me, and I know I'm not as good as you probably think I am, right? And you know you better than I know you, And what I know about you is you're probably not as good as I think you are, right? That's just reality. So let's give them a little bit of a break. We have a little bit of history here that we're going to glean from that's going to help us decide who the real Jesus is. Well, there's five parts of this I want to flesh out over the next, I don't know, hour and a half. Okay, so here it goes. You ready? Here's the first one. Big word. Ready? Jesus is the providential king. Don't, don't make no mistake, when Jesus comes in, they're treating him like a king would be treated. They're laying the cloaks on the ground, uh, they're waving palm branches, he's riding on a donkey. All of these images would be familiar to the first century. If somebody rode into town on a donkey right now and people are throwing their jackets and their, and their blankets in front of him, we're going to think they're crazy, okay? But if you're in the first century, this is somewhat of what we call a coronation. It's a celebration And there's a lot of things in this that they understand that they're asking Jesus and they're crowning him to be their next king. So the reason, I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell, that the reason that things changes from from when he comes into town to when he's crucified is because he's not the king they wanted him to be. All right, that's what's really at stake here. He's not going to be the king they wanted him to be. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the first thing you need to understand is he is a providential king. And this is a hard truth. What it means is this. Divine providence is, is um, defined as this. God's preserving his creation, operating in every event in the world, and directing them, or the things in this universe, to his appointed end for them. In other words, providence is God determining the direction of events in order to accomplish his purposes. Now, before you bow out, let me, let me support it a little bit, okay? We love this scripture, so let me give you one we all love to quote that supports the idea that God is providential. Here it is. And we know in Romans eight twenty eight that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans is saying that when you are serving and operating under the Holy Spirit and the leadership of God, there is a directing of your life that God directs for good. It doesn't just happen to turn out good. It's not just coincidental that things turn out the best way they should. He's saying he works them to be good. Now, your good and my good and his good may look a little different, right? I don't know about you, but when I'm sick, they tell me to take Robitussin. I hate that stuff, right? I hate cough medicine. Now, it's good for me, and it's definitely good for Julie to sleep at night next to me instead of me hacking up a lung. But what I feel good with and what actually is good are not always the same thing, okay? So God's providence doesn't mean everything's going to feel good in your life. It doesn't mean everything's going to work out to what you would consider good, but it's going to work out to what is actually good, okay? Okay. So that's what he says in Romans 8. Let, let's listen to another passage. He says in Proverbs 16, 30, The lot, that's dice, by the way, is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. I was in Vegas a few weeks ago. I said, Lord, I'm claiming that promise. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> And here's what I determined. The Lord did not want me to have money. Okay? 
<laughs> All joking aside, though, it's pointing to God's providence, okay? Once again, things that we think are luck, coincidental, happenstance. He's going, God is providential, guys. God is involved. There's a lot of people that think that God spun this world into place, and they just kind of walked off, and now everything just happens as it happens. We're theists as Baptists, right? So we believe that God is involved in the affairs of this world. Now, we may disagree on how involved, but I think the Scripture teaches he's pretty involved. In Ephesians chapter um, 1, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we have all this supporting evidence that says that God is providential. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, I want you to look. It says, he says, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Now, does that mean that Jesus walked by and saw the donkey and, and the colt tied? No. We know that Jesus is being providential here. His divine nature is saying, you're going to walk into town, there's going to be a donkey, there's going to be a colt, you're going to take them, the person's going to say, what you doing with my donkey and colt? And Jesus says in all these texts of vernacular, you tell him, the master needs them, we'll bring them back, right? And that's exactly what happens, that's not a coincidence. Something we learn here in this passage about Jesus is that he is a providential king. He steers the affairs of this world in a way that he desires. Well, here's the, the two arguments against that, and then we're going to move on. Number one, you may say, well, that means that when I do things, I do things I don't even choose to do. God just makes me do them. No, that is not what I'm saying at all. God's providence works in concert with man's choices in order to accomplish God's plans. I want you to hear me, because uh, some of you are going to quote me wrong on this, okay? Some of y'all are going to be like, do you hear what the preacher said? I'm telling you right now, listen to this. I wrote this line myself. God's providence works in concert with man's will in order to accomplish God's plans. What we're saying is this. This is a hard truth, but God is in control. And no matter the decisions you make, God is still in control. But God is mysteriously able to accomplish the plans in your life, even when you make boneheaded decisions. I don't get that, but I'm happy, right? Like, aren't you thankful that we don't serve a God who has to call an audible in heaven every time we screw up, right? Can you imagine in heaven? Oh, no, Chris is talking. Omaha, fudge Omaha, right? Like, right, Chris is talking again. I know he's going to say something stupid, right? He's going to say something boneheaded, and we're going to have to switch the whole plan of heaven because we didn't count for this. Guys, let me tell you something. God is providential. He is, he is involved in your life. Even in the boneheaded mistakes, he is directing and pressing and shaping your life for his purposes. Now, I think what's really cool about this is he gives you the will to make decisions that help influence in a way that is good for you. Like you can make boneheaded decisions that make your life turn out bad, but it doesn't mean that God's still not in control of your life. Well, how is that possible? I don't know. Ask him when you get there. Okay, I don't know. But I just know the scripture teaches it, right? I don't have to understand it to enjoy it, right? I don't have to, I don't have to understand it, right? I don't, I don't, I don't fully know how my grandma makes chocolate pie, but I'm still going to eat some of that, right? I don't know what kind of magical touch she had. I don't know what kind of angel tears she dropped in that stuff, but whatever it was, it was good. And, and that's the thing we have to deal with. We deal with hard doctrines like this, that Christ is providential, that he directs and he guides and he moves well, we have to understand that God is still in control. Well, well, then there's another argument. Well, if that makes no sense. If why are so many bad things happening? Then if God is good and He's able to control what He desires, because this assumes that we're on the level of God in planning and decision making capacity. I don't know why there's so much quote bad in the world, and why God allows it to go on. But here's what I want to, I want to give you this thought, and then we're going to move on. Aren't you glad that God doesn't zap you in judgment, 
but is patient with your sin. Why is there so much evil in the world? Because we have a patient, patient God who by all rights has the authority and the capacity and the right to end us on the spot, but chooses to let us go on in our ignorance because he's patient. You see, what this does for me, when I look at the, the providence of God, it doesn't scare me. It comforts me knowing that even when the world seems out of control, I know that there is a God who's in control. It emboldens my faith. That's why when people say, Chris, do you get discouraged when you preach and you preach and you preach and nobody comes down? Why would I get discouraged? My call is not to convict your hearts. My call is to preach the word. It's the Spirit's job to convict your hearts. Your eternity doesn't hang on my eloquence. Praise God. Right? Your eternity doesn't hang on my ability. I have a call to proclaim the word of God. You have a decision to make to receive it or not. And it's the spirit working in concert with your will that will help determine what you do. It's not on me. I'll give an account of how I taught. I'll give an account of what I did and how I stewarded it. But your eternity doesn't hang in the balance because of me. It emboldens my faith. It reassures me. It challenges me as I have to come to terms with the fact that sometimes, even though God can do anything, I still have to go through valleys. It, it, it challenges my faith to go, you know, even though I know God could in this, God doesn't. And sometimes you don't even know why, right? But I'll tell you this, one thing I've learned is the hardest times in my life that I wish God would have ended, had he ended it too early, I would have not have seen the benefit on the other side that I now enjoy. That's just how it works. And so it should encourage us, it should comfort us, but it is challenging as well to know that God is providential. The second truth that we see here, and this in verse 4, is that Jesus is the promised king. Look at verse 4. It says, okay, after he gets the donkey, it says the, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. He says, look, the reason this whole donkey scenario played out is because back in Zechariah, he prophesied that the king would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And so Jesus has to come in on a donkey. And so he providentially prepares a donkey, and then he gets on the donkey, and he rides into town just like the Messiah was supposed to. It was a prophecy from hundreds of years ago that Messiah would come in on a donkey. I want to tell you something. The Jewish mind would have really focused on this. They would have looked at this and have been like, well, we remember Zechariah. This is, this is it. This is what he's talking about. And what was confirmed to them by prophecy one day was out the window as they crucified him another day. And my question is, is why would you allow the certainty of the prophecy to derail your belief a few days later? It's because you lost faith in the God of the prophecy. You see, when I look at this, I'm, I'm blown away because I've read the scientific studies before, but I'll tell you, just summarizing, science has told us it's pretty much an imp impossibility for one man to fulfill even eight specific prophecies from the Old Testament to the New. Jesus fulfilled over 300 of them. It's almost just impossible to imagine. I've even told you the odds that, that even people of science have taken the possibilities and, and, and mathematics and they've extrapolated it out. And they said, basically, for one person to fulfill eight specific prophecies hundreds of years ago to now, for one person to fit eight specific ones like Jesus did... It would literally be the odds of taking one silver dollar, putting tape on it, putting it in the state of Texas somewhere, and putting two more feet of silver dollars on it, and you blindfold someone and ask them to pick the one with tape out. That's the mathematical probability that one man could fulfill eight specific prophecies. Jesus fulfilled over 300 let me tell you, when, when you hear people talking about Jesus today, and you hear them talking about, well, he's just a neat idea, or all that's made up, there is historical and literary and archaeological evidence that Jesus truly is the Messiah. 
And it is prophesied again and again in the Old Testament. He is the rightful king that they have been waiting for. And the source of the rub is not that he's not the king. It's just he's not the king they want. He's just not the kind of king they want. He's kind of a peculiar king. That's the third truth. He's a peculiar king. Look at it. What does it say? He says, well, if you look at what happens... He's riding in on a donkey, on the colt, on the foal of a beast of burden. Even though that's familiar, it's a little odd, right? What's the king they wanted? Conquering mighty warrior. You see, in that particular day and age, when a king would come in for battle, he would ride in more likely on a white horse. He'd have a sword in his hand, and he would be, you know, kicking tail and taking names, right? That's the king they wanted. That's the king we always like, right? There's not a lot of stories about kings riding in on donkeys in our culture, right? It's always like, I mean, I mean, we have a, you know, Shrek is a good example. A donkey is not a noble animal for the most part, right? Shrek made the sermon, who thought? But anyway, if you don't watch it, don't go. Okay, don't watch it now. Um, but there's some things about the donkey you need to understand is, is even in this day and age, there, there was a custom for some kings in a time of peace, they would ride in on a donkey into town. So, so they, would have, they would have seen that, and they would have still been nobility. But then there's a very humble piece of this. There's a very, uh, there's, there's a very um, you know, there's an honorable thing about the way he comes in. But they kind of miss the fact that he's not going to be the king they want. He's going to be different. He's going to not come to conquer the way they want. He's not going to be self-serving, self-promoting or even self-preserving, actually, he's going to come and he's going to die rather than having people die for them. You see, the thing about being a king is you have people for that, right? And I don't know about y'all, but I would love to live a life where I have people for that, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, you heard people like, I'll get my people to talk to your people. I just want to have people one day. But, um, but kings have people for that, and, and kings don't go and die for their kingdom. They have other people do that for them. Right? I mean, the greatest nation of this world, you think about it. I mean, yeah, sometimes kings do die, but it's usually the last thing that happens. Like, they've already had a lot of other people die for them. But Jesus comes, and everything's upside down with Jesus. Jesus comes as the one who is the only rightful king the world has ever seen. But instead of coming into the world and demanding the world serve him in that moment, he comes to serve the world. That's what makes Christianity different than any other world religion. The king comes to us and serves our need. We don't attain righteousness to get to the king. The king knows we'll never make it on our own. And so he comes and lets us take his righteousness and he takes on our sin and trades places. That's what happens at the cross. It's just at the Passover, the lamb that was slaughtered on day 14 had done nothing wrong. The lamb that was slaughtered was actually innocent. It was without blemish. That was on purpose to talk about. This is, a, this is as perfect of an animal as you can possibly find. It's to give a picture that there is going to be a perfect sacrifice that's one day going to be slaughtered, and it's going to have no fault of its own. But when its blood is shed, the only way that the people can have hope is that the blood of the lamb is applied to their account, and their sin is laid on the lamb. And he says, that's what Jesus does. He's not a typical king. He is a peculiar king. He's not going to come like you think. He's not going to come to lift you up to high places on this earth. He's going to come to give you a place in eternity. And you're not going to have a king who always gives you what you want on this earth, but you're going to give you a king. You're going to have a king who gives you everything you need to serve him. You see, he's a peculiar king. And a lot of people reject God because they want a version of him, but they don't want all of him. They, they want the version of Jesus that blesses them. They want the version of Jesus that, that does good things for them, but they don't want the version of Jesus that they now serve back. Because if we're going to serve our king, then we have to serve like our king, right? And which, which is it's ironic because Jesus is so popular but the very thing that makes him popular is the very thing they kind of crucify him for. What made him popular? Feeding the masses, the miracles, the serving. But when he goes all the way to the point of the cross, that's just too far. 
And so you see Jesus, the popular king. And I put quotations on king in my notes because I want to make sure you understand this. I don't think Jesus is king at this point to the crowd. He's popular. Look at the people coming. They're laying their cloaks down. They're saying, Hosanna, son of David. Jesus is a rock star at this part of the story. But that's not really who Jesus came to be. He came to be a servant. And they were following Jesus as long as their lives were made physically better, but rejected him when it seemed like that was in jeopardy. The, quote, version of Jesus is still popular today, right? I mean, we're all about Jesus when things are going good, but when things go bad, I'm not sure I really want to follow him, right? And even sometimes when life goes bad, people, they come back to Jesus. Why? Because we want him to make it good again. Not because we're in love with Jesus, right? After 9-11, churches were full the next two to three weeks. They were absolutely packed, especially in the Northeast. And if you know much about the Northeast United States, churches are fairly empty up that way. They were packed full. Why? Because we are hurting, and we don't want to hurt anymore. But as soon as the sting of that went away, so did that desire for Jesus. Why? Because we're in love with the Jesus who makes us feel better, but not in love with the Jesus who actually makes us better. It's, it's, it's a huge difference here. And as I was praying, just kind of preparing for this sermon, this is what I kept drilling down to, and just praying, God, what is it you want us to hear today? What is it you want us to see? And all I could really get down to was this idea that we better be cautious that we're not chasing after a Jesus that's not even real. Make sure you tell them there's a Jesus who loves you and died for you and went to the cross for you and is resurrected for you, but you don't get to make him to be something he is not. He's not here to just make life better here and now. He's not here to just make the sting of death go away. He's here to be your king, your lord, your ruler, your savior. And if you don't want him in any one of those capacities, I don't know that you really can get him at all. He is a peculiar king. He's a popular king, and he's the prophet king. Look there at verse 11. Everybody's like, who is this guy? And it says, the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, I think that's telling, because I don't, I don't know that they fully see him as he is. They say he's a prophet, and they're right. I think there's more to the truth, but he is a prophet. He's the one who tells the heartbeat of God to the people around. A prophet's two different things, right? A prophet in the Old Testament, they foretold things. They told things coming up in the future, but they were foretellers. They told things from the heart of God, right? And so a prophet was not just somebody who told the future. There's somebody who told the truth about the present. Well, Jesus was a prophet like that. He told things that were from the heartbeat of God, and he communicated with people around him the things of God. I want to tell you today, Jesus is still a prophet king. He is still the one who has the word of life. He's still the one that has the final word on everything we face. When you look at life and you think about what you want to do in any decision, I know the temptation is so often we go to our friends, we go to our family, we come to the preacher, but we don't go to the one source that has truth that's completely accurate, and that's the word of God. I want to tell you something today. Jesus is a prophet king, and what that means is, is when we look at the word of God, we either take that as the authority for our life or we reject it for the authority of our life. I can't tell you how many people I've counseled over the years who when you come to their life and what they're dealing with, we can talk all day in circles, but finally we have to get to the problem. And we start looking at your life compared to what God teaches in this particular area, whether your marriage or addictions or anger or whatever it might be. And we begin to hold the word of God up as a mirror to our lives. And as soon as someone says, well, I know God's word says that, but I don't think that, we're done with counseling because that's the source of truth. And if you don't take Jesus as the prophet king who is the authority on everything you face, then you're going to miss out on the life God has called you to live. What is it God wants? What is it that God is desiring? What is it that God wants to see come to light in your life? It's in his word is where it starts. So we're having a quick time of invitation right now. I'm going to try to get us out of here. But I want to ask you a few questions in relation to kind of this Palm Sunday passage. And that, these five questions really is that. 
Will we trust God in his wisdom as he providentially guides our lives? I, I would go out on a limb and say that I'm imagining there's people in this room right now that you are going through a hard time. And the fact that God is providential is not comforting in this moment. That's okay. It really is okay. It's challenging. Because it's like, well then, God, how could I be going through this horrible time if you really are in control? And, and the problem is you want to take that question to people like me or to someone else. And you ever heard that it's above my pay grade? That one's well above my pay grade. I don't know why your circumstances are like they are right now. But I know this, that God is still in control. I do know that. And, and I know that if you will continue to come to him and seek him and, and, and continue to, to ask him to help you understand and to help you work through this, he will not leave you in that. He will guide you through the hardest, darkest valley you can imagine. He will. He's guided me through some valleys that I never knew I would come out of. You ever been in a valley so dark? It's like people talk about there's light at the end of the tunnel and you're just sitting there going, I don't see light anywhere. You ever been there? You just feel hopeless. You just, you don't see a single, you don't even know which way to go next. It's all you can do to just breathe and get through the day. I don't want to sound dramatic, guys, but I've been there. I mean, you think of all sorts of ways out. You do. And I'm going to tell you, it took time and just continued going back to the throne, telling God how hopeless I was for me to finally begin to see the light that he brings. God knows where you are. You're not going to surprise him by telling you how bad off you are. Believe it or not, God knows you're angry. You can tell him, God, I'm very angry. God knows you're scared. You can tell God, I'm, I'm so scared, God. Did you know, I'm going to be honest, there was a time in my life where I just I hated this person. I did. I just hated him. And I knew I wasn't supposed to because, my gosh, I'm a Christian and much less I'm a pastor too. And, and I, just, I just carried that for so long until I just finally went to the Father and said, God, I hate them. I hate them. I know I'm not supposed to. I know it's not what you've created me for, but I do. And it was only then that he began to break the hatred down and give me love for that person. That was the only time. God can handle what you're going through. Maybe you're here and you've got a bad diagnosis and you're scared. Can I tell you something? God is in control. He will walk with you through anything you face. He is in control. The second question is, will we gain confidence as we consider all the prophecies that point to Christ? Does it not give you hope and confidence as you share Jesus, that you don't just share another world religion, but you share the Savior of the world with people? I'm going to tell you something, guys. I've, I told y'all before, I've had that crisis of belief where I wondered, man, am I only believing this stuff because I've, I've heard it my whole life? You, you ever been there? Like, am I just believing this stuff because I've just, I've had it shoved down my throat, so to speak. You know what I'm talking about? My parents drug me to church all the time. You know, am I just believing it because I was raised in the Bible belt? Is that why I'm believing all this stuff? And I went to the science and I went to the history and I went to the criticism of the literature and I came out believing more strongly than ever in a sufficiency of Christ. Let me tell you, Christ is real, and there is evidence to point you to him. Will you gain confidence? Will you rest in the fact that he's peculiar and different than the kings of this world, and that his economy is sometimes upside down, but it doesn't make him any less king? I, I know sometimes it's the weirdest thing when you follow Christ because you have to fight that flesh to lord things over people, right? Especially when you know better. Right? It's, it's, like, it's like sometimes you ever talk to someone and, and they're debating something with you and you, and you just, man, they just don't get it. And you want to use the holy, you, you know, wrestling move and just put them out of their misery. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, they're, they're just, how do I say it? Just they're ignorant. 
Okay? And you've got just the right word to put them in their place. But you serve a king who doesn't operate like that. You serve a king who loves and guides and is patient and kind and gentle with people and nudges them to the truth. Will you serve the king even though it's peculiar sometimes? Will we serve him only when it's easier or follow him when it's easier to go the way of the crowd? Popular religion is easy. There's a version of Jesus right now that's popular in our culture. It's a really nice guy. He does all these good things for people. He gives you all the nice things in life you want. He blesses you when you're struggling and, you know, always makes sure you have money in your pocket. I don't know about y'all, but I've served Jesus since I was 10 years old. And that's not the version of Jesus I know. There's times that are hard. There's times that are lean. There's times that you give generously not knowing what's going to come behind that. There, there's times where you serve Jesus that you're just, you're just being faithful for the next thing in the road. And you don't know what the step is after that. I'm going to tell you something. Will we serve him only when it's easy or convenient or popular? Or will we serve him even when it requires a sacrifice from us? And will we hear from his word and obey it and find our counsel there rather than somewhere else? I don't know. I think you can accept or you can reject, but I want to make sure you understand this is the Jesus of the Bible. And if you reject him today, I want you to reject him on who he actually is instead of who you think he is from what you've heard from culture, that God loves you so much that he brought you here today. I believe with all my heart, there's people in this room right now that God has brought into this place to invite you into his presence to accept him as your savior. And if you're here and you don't know what to do next, but you know that God is calling you to do something, I'd invite you to come down as we sing. You can come talk to me or one of the other staff members afterwards. But don't let today go by without being obedient to what God wants you to do in your life. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's respond in obedience to God.